Thank you, Gülzin, also, again. See you again for your generous hospitality. I came here with great pleasure, and um, I look forward now to share with all of you some thoughts that fit, namely, to Sunday. We have Sunday. Originally, we planned this speech for Saturday, then we had to change, so it's even better now, because my, a Sunday for me, memory from early childhood, this is going to the church. And um, so it fits quite, quite well that two scopes now, me and afterwards um, Frank, will speak about subjects relating to religion. So this is something like going to the Holy Mass um, Sunday morning with a tie, you know, everything. Um, fitting to that event. Um, I have some memories, to, some very strong memories to um, church uh, relationships. Um, one went to the church uh, on Sunday morning um, with our own, with my own family. I did the same in the beginning until then finally I, I quit my membership in that organization called Catholic Church, but, but I'm still interested in it. And I have some, some, uh, some, some memories of it that are not bad. Really. So now this topic today is not just about religion, but about law, of course, since I'm a lawyer. This time not about my lawsuit still in preparation against Swiss Confederation, uh, maybe another year I will come back to this. But today we have this um, topic from divine law to papal infallibility and back again. You have some handouts, you know, a handout. Uh, this is not because it's that important that you have to take it in hands and you know, file in your most important documents, but just because the letters would be too small to see. So you can follow this chart. This chart will accompany us during this, um, this ideas I'm going to share with you now. We have the blue line and uh, the yellow line. This is not a subway line, but the blue line is the Pope line. This is the church line. And the yellow line is the state line, the king line however you call it. So the one is up there near heaven, uh, has to do with God, with ideas, with higher spheres. Um, there down you have, you know, the feet on the ground, earth, world, reality. And you always have in history, I think, some interesting relations. These are, you know, there is a certain competition. There are parallelities between these two lines. And this also is in connection of, of these issues we are going to, to look at now. So, for instance, papal supremacy, Ganossa, um, um, is in a certain relation, compet um, certain uh, competition, so to speak, with, with the states or the king's absolutism, uh, things like that. But this is early times. Um, that what what is also a uh, uh, interesting relation is um, how to deal with that upper, that far sphere, um, you know, up there in heaven, so to speak. Um, what about divine law, which was a big tradition in um, um, earlier times? Lex eterna, the eternal law regularities that we do not know precisely, but we can try to understand them, you know. And of course, the church had an important role on that, Thomas Aquinas, for instance, um, and the whole ecclesiastical magisterium, so how to communicate it with the world, that was a, a big issue, of course. And on the other hand, you say the corresponding issue back there on Earth is science. Science and, for instance, now what the king as such is concerned, what about the position of the king? Uh, interesting um, a book in the, um, in the Scottish Enlightenment 
Lex Rex, I always mention that book, um, Lex Rex, which means that not Rex, Lex, Rex is not superior to Lex, but it's the other way around. He also is under some laws. Which laws, again, is the difficult question. Then we, we come a bit closer now, historically, in the 19th century, which is always an interesting uh, time frame for such questions. And here now we have an aspect of legitimation that comes up. Um, how shall we legitimize the king? He is not just there, absolutistic, but, but he, he looks for some, some legitimation. Uh, for instance, that, that he is covered by some legs, by some, some laws. Um, so legitimation comes up as a, as a postulate, so to speak, for the state, for the king, and corresponding, maybe this is a bit strange now, um, but um, I will explain that, corresponding on the level of um, religion, of, of the blue line, so to speak, we have Mary Immaculate Conceived. This is not to confound with the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Um, so, um, Mary Immaculate Conceived, this is the moment nine months before Mary's birth. Um, so, and it, it means, that's a, a ecclesiastical dogma, this means that in the very moment Mary was conceived in, in the belly of her mother, she was not just a human being um, as any others, but she was immaculate, free of original sin. But whatever this picture then means, we will come back to this. But this was in 1854, a dogma issued by the Catholic Church. And now it becomes more interesting for our subject. On the one hand, one could say legitimation and maybe power also here down comes up. In Italy, <coughs> prominently in Italy, this Risorgimento, this unification movement of Italy, um, still a monarch, but a constitutional monarch, um, uh, Vittorio Emanuele, um, who had the function to unify this country. And you could say, on the other hand, on the blue line, you also have a movement into more organized um, structures and not, it's not by coincidence that just in those times um, Pope Pius IX um, did assemble this first Vatican, um, Vatican Council. So there were many councils in history but not in Rome. And this is not by accident that it was there, you know, to underline, to, to show that we also have some centralized organization comparable to national states coming up in that time. And within this um, Vatican Council, among other decisions, this famous papal infallibility was decided. And this now meant that um, unlike earlier when one just tried to understand these other spheres, now the Pope, he knows it. Once he declared something within his infallibility, then it's not just a trying to understand it, but then it's like that. This is a a, another function, a more precise and more decisive function the Pope has. Now he knows these other spheres. One could say it's then the basis for positivation of that, um, of that divine law. So this is an interesting development until that time, 1870. Um, uh, this person, I mentioned already, plays an important role there. Um, Pius IX was elected as Pope 18, 
46. Then this dogma I already mentioned comes from him. Um, he um, firmly resisted this movement for um, unification of um, Italy and then this first Vatican Council with some points not to discuss today more in detail, supremacy of papal, papal jurisdiction, um, some preparation for a codex also comparable to the corresponding movements uh, in the states and now this papal infallibility that was decided in that council. Now what is this, this papal infallibility? Um, that was decided on the 18th of July, 1870, within a document called Pastor Eternus, so, um, um, Eternal Shepherd. And there in chapter 4, we have this, um, this text here, translated from, from, from uh, Latin, of course. We teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman pontiff, the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, so a bit like me now, you know, so in a, in a, in a formal way, that is when in discharge of an office of pastor and doctor of all Christians by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority. This really fits, you know, like a church Sunday morning, what I'm telling you now, this is a bit... Um, from the, the, the council in, in, in German, I would, it's that, you know, the, the priest in the church, it's, it fits to the situation. Um, so when he defines a doctrine regarding faith or morals to be held by the universal church, then by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter, who is the personification of the Pope function, he is possessed of that infallibility with which the divine redeemer willed that his church should be endowed in defining doctrine regarding faith or morals. And that therefore such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not from the consent of the church, so that's not a democratic um, structure, irreformable. This is the infallibility dogma. Um, what is now the consequence? That is always interesting for lawyers. You know, you have some norm, you have to do this or that, but what is if somebody does not agree, does object to it? And for that point too, there is an answer. So then, should anyone, which God forbid, have the temerity to reject this definition of ours, let him be anathema. Anathema, you come to, to this also, is something like, like um, it's not, uh, he will not be burned or tortured. We are in the 19th century, we are not under the Inquisition. Um, anathema is more like excommunication. He will not be one of ours anymore. Not a too invasive sanction but nevertheless a sanction. So this was this um, proud um, infallibility dogma, and now you perhaps uh, are asking yourself, what is the church now going to do with this, let's say, um, interesting rationalized basis of a, of a sort of absolute um, power to have the truth, things like that, is now the church going out and conquering the world um, with uh, no, this certainty that the, the church, the pope itself, he, he can define what the laws are. Now, this what not, was not precisely the case because quite soon afterwards, um, it is between the 11th and 12th September, precisely the opposite happened. Italian troops entered the church state, conquered um, Rome without any resistance. So that was the primary result of this um, infallibility dogma, historically. Um, so our poor Pope Pius IX, after having um, 
defined this papal infallibility. He, he, he lost, so in a way, the political uh, competition. Uh, he still refused um, to be officially um, tolerated by the new Italian state. Um, he was offered the statute of guarantee, um, which he refused. He, d he died a um, couple of years later, and maybe sort of consolation for him, perhaps, in the year, the year 2000, he was beatified by John Paul II. And it, it's quite interesting, we can do that too, uh, in, in the, 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 the memorandum, so to speak, for this beatification. Um, it was said that um, his special, um, you know, um, what, 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 he, what he did uh, in order then to be beatified was uh, harmonizing faith and reason, which is an interesting combination. Now, uh, let's see that again on our chart. Now, we were just in the middle there, this cross um, road, 1870, and now we saw this papal infallibility not much came out of this, you know, on the blue line. Uh, no really um, strong use of this infability. Some plans for codifications, but uh, that came much later then. On the other hand, here we have something quite strong concerning infallibility. So one could say that at that cross point and where the state was the winner against the church in, in that historical context um, and where the church tr defined something like infallibility, it was finally the state who took that sort of, sort of like a prey, you know, he took that with him and used it on his line, on the yellow line, quite extensively, as you know, which is our problem today um, out of that. So the state then, he was um, able not only to know what the laws are, he was now in a position to make the laws. He now became the source of law, which was not the case in earlier times. Then, just to mention it, um, by the way, the Lateran Treaty, that was an arrangement between church and and, um, and the state uh, in the 20th century, we have in 1950 something again has to do with, with theo theological dogmas, Mary's assumption to heaven. We'll come to, back to this too. Um, we have the state who is not interested um, about these other fears. He makes the law himself, but we have the church who still tries to understand um, what, what about other spheres that we do not know that precisely? So we have now the whole chart and, and how this corresponds. Now to, to, to look at the blue chart a, a bit more precise now, what, what was made with this papal infallibility nevertheless? Something was made with it, not very much, but this. On the one hand, that dogma, Mary's assumption to heaven, a beautiful image, a picture if you want, that was declared not just as a dogma, but based on papal infallibility. This was the first and almost only decision under this infallibility clause. Um, so a purely the, um, theological um, aspect that Mary, was after her death assumed in heaven and retroactively this Mary Immaculate dogma also was declared to be true under the infallibility dogma. So beautiful pictures, you know, um, Mary Immaculate, Mary Assumption to Heaven. This was what came out in applying this infallibility dogma. So something which has to do with heaven, you know, um, from heaven to heaven, things like that. And out of this, this is quite interesting, then came a sort of legitimation 
of religious truth. One could say, um, out of this, we have the Pope with his papal infallibility. We have those divine laws out there, some diffuse issues, and between Mary as a symbol of the church, sort of interface, one could say, between those spheres and our world. Um, and here we have now, based on this infallibility, um, an argument that must be put in there, because um, why is the church um, in a position to define what, what, what is up there, what are these norms, moral norms, things like that. Um, and once this goes via church, the church must be something, uh, of course it's something on earth, but it should also have um, the, the, the cleanness, so to speak, um, in order to be able to transform this uh, back uh, down to us. So, so it's, it's, it's sort of rational that um, even though the church, Mary, Mary as a symbol, is part of earth, it must be free of sin, immaculate. And also, um, Mary is something of this world, the church is in this world, but in a way, you know, that's why it was assumed to heaven, in a way it's from another world. So, so these two aspects need to be inbuilt in the logic of this uh, legitimation. And out of this then comes, you know, that you have sort of application of this comes down to doctrine regarding faith and morals for all Christians. And again, should anyone have the temerity to reject this, he shall be anathema, which is which is, I always said that, something quite non-invasive, one could say in that case, let him be not one of ours anymore. That's all. That's the sanction. So, sort of, we, we the church, respect um, here the right, one could say, of the people to be left alone. This is the whole consequence. We, we have our rationality, um, and therefore, these are our laws and our morals. Uh, but if one does not accept this, okay, then, then he is not one of ours. Actually, uh, uh, one could say a convincing uh, scheme. Maybe this is also what was said later, that it was a harmonization of, of faith and, ra and reason and rationality. You recall this beatification of John, of, of Pope Pius IX, that he was beatified because of this. He had ideas to harmonize, harmonize faith and reason. Um, now, what about the yellow line? Something quite similar, but not identical. Here too, we have this institution, now it's not the church, but it's the national state that, that came up, this, this organization we heard yesterday from Professor um, where is the teacher? Um, Norman, um, that, that, that this was sort of a, a new structure like, like Fukuyama, end of history, you know, the national state with his his organizations and so on. This is sort of corresponding to secular, the secularized structure um, uh, instead of the church. That is the national state. He is not anymore an interface to some higher spheres, but he himself is the original source of law. So that higher, for instance, divine or natural or however you call it, higher law is not the issue anymore. Um, but nevertheless, it's very useful to have these two elements, to have the argument that this organization, like Mary Immaculate, is part of this world, but it's immaculate. It's, in a way, different from anybody else. If somebody within this national state, in this official function, makes something that for normal people would be a crime, if he does it, 
he is immaculate. Now, this is a practical argument for such an organization. And that it's in a way, however, you just have to believe it, in a way also a higher, um, a higher being, this too is very practical to take it over from these ideas from the church, so assumption to heaven. So the state is immaculate and he is assumed to heaven and this is quite a practical um, basis in order now to make the application to that on, on, on the world, to define doctrine regarding legal norms for all inhabitants of the country. And now it comes the very interesting question. Should anyone have the temerity to reject this? Let him be. Now, what, what says the state? Does he also say anathema? So let him, let him be alone. Um, is this the conclusion the state says? I think you know it's not. It's not the answer by the state. Um, so you could also say that once you apply the dogma, the papal infability dogma as a governmental infability dogma, you can change just some very few words, words these, these red parts. It's the same text as the, the church version. You have the, the state version. Um, uh, so when he officially defines something in an official procedure, the constitution, the law procedure, things like that, and uh, whatever norms these are, um, promised by risorgimento, whatever the, the reasoning is, then that therefore such definitions by the state are themselves and not from the consent of the people, again, not a democratic aspect, irreformable. So then, should anyone have the temerity to reject this definition of ours, let him be Anathema, no, not anathema, but forced, arrested, expropriated, killed, whatever the um, consequence is, even though the basis is just faith. So within this chart, we have um, on the bottom here the consequence. If you do not believe in that, in these nice pictures, um, if you do not believe in it, you are not convinced in it, you will be forced to follow them. So it's not a harmonization of faith and reason, but it's enforcement of faith, um, which is, of course, a big difference to um, what was the idea of this dogma for Pope Pius IX. Um, again, um, that was not, would not correspond to harmonizing faith and reason. Um, what would have corresponded, and this is the, the final idea now, uh, if you really do apply this idea of harmonization of faith and rationality to the state, then, then why not to use these pictures? Uh, then Mary as a symbol, not for the church, but for the state, is still an interface. It's not the source of law, but it's an interface between these higher spheres. Probably you would not call them divine law anymore, but maybe real law, natural law, rule of law, things like that. But there is something that the state cannot do more than trying to understand and to communicate it um, with, with society. Um, so that would be a part of a consistent uh, regime. And if you like to use these beautiful um, pictures, why not? Then say, um, just for the sake of rationality, let's say it's uh, immaculate. Um, and let's say it's somehow higher, even though it grounded here on Earth. And then you can deduct from top to down these norms, why not? But the final um, consequence would then not be that um, the people who do reject that they will be punished or forced, but okay, then they will not be one of ours anymore. Not more than this. Um, you are invited to believe in this, 
um, that could be for many people perhaps a, a good scheme, a, a sort of rationalized scheme of ideas that are not that clear for everybody or for all, but why not to use pictures like that? But keeping in mind that it's not more than a community of faith and that some, if somebody does not want to adhere, okay, he can go out. He can go out, he must not move out. He must not move to a other country or to another address, but um, he can quit his membership um, of this organization. That actually would be, you know, what one could think about nice Sunday morning. That would be a good plan for the state. That could be a, a project. That could be maybe the future of the state, but certainly you know um, um, this is not the case today, at least. Um, maybe it will be the case some later on, but once it will be um, uh, realized, then it, it is, it would be a miracle. And as you know, once you have miracles, you are not only beatified, but once a miracle is there, you will be canonized so that would be time for St. Paul Pius IX. Thank you. <laughs>